in the year 95 AD. From an island in the Aegean Sea, a message emerged. A letter penned to paper by John, but delivered through a vision by Jesus Christ. A message meant to encourage and challenge seven churches in Asia. To help them overcome apathy and moral compromise and to help them choose faithfulness. 2,000 years later, the same message is true for us today. We are invited into the book of Revelation not to decode a secret puzzle or wild imagery, but to get a glimpse of God's plan for a new creation. Well, good morning, everyone. White horses, fine linen, a lake of burning sulfur, and a dragon. Welcome to Revelation 19 and 20. Um, I don't usually title sermons, but if I had to title this morning, two possible titles, <clears throat> and I say this mostly um, just to kind of like forecast the content of it. Uh, two options could be final battles, and uh, notice that the battle part is plural, or visions of final justice. Visions of final justice. Uh, with that said, we got a lot, a lot to cover. Probably going to go a little long this morning. So hop in to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to start at verse 11. Um, if you need a Bible, I'm going to be reading from these. They're right underneath your chairs. You can take one home. Page 847. So let me read um, this first vision a final justice here of a battle. John writes, verse 11, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. Um, now, we're never told the name of this rider, uh, but who do you think this is? All right, Jesus, here we go. That's always the best answer in church. With justice, he judges and wages war. And notice there, it's not with vindictive revenge, but justice. With justice, he rages war. It's very important. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. And he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood. We'll come back to that. His name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and they're dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter, and he treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe, on his thigh, he has this name written, maybe does Jesus have a tattoo? King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God. And that is an intentional grim contrast to the supper of the Lamb which comes right before this. So that you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and the mighty of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Verse 19. And then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against this rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. And with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And the rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider of the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Like I said, white horses, fine linen, and a lake of burning sulfur. Welcome to Revelation 19. Um, when John writes this, when he receives this vision in the first century, 
There were stories and stories told, both from Rome and from Jewish people, of a kind of messianic warrior king, a warrior king who would come into town on a white horse just after he had slayed all his enemies and had been in like a vindictive bloodbath. And he comes back on a white horse to symbolize his victory. Um, in that culture, military commanders or emperors or warriors were glorified. That's who they celebrated and honored and who you wanted to be. Um, go read Isaiah 63, which is the echo of so much of this passage. And so it happens so often with people in this this first vision of a battle of final justice, is they take Jesus here on the white horse and they say, oh, Jesus is coming back and he's vindictive and he's coming after a bloodbath and he's going to take a sword and he's just going to kill everyone. I mean, literally three days ago, I was in a meeting with a couple other lead pastors and a guy showed us this video of a very well-known pastor here in America. I'm not going to say his name. But he just went off in the sermon of how, oh, well, Jesus came loving people and he sacrificed for you on the cross and he was like a lamb and he was soft and he was loving. But in his second coming, he's coming back and he's just going to kill everyone. And he was like celebrating that. And what happens is if that's the way that you interpret this passage, I'm going to get into it, you end up with a bipolar Jesus. You got Jesus in his first coming, who loves his neighbor and goes to the cross and spills his blood for you and I, the definition of sacrifice. But then at his second coming, he comes back with a vindictive bloodbath. What, how do we make sense of this? Is Jesus bipolar? By the way, I don't think he is. Or maybe, just maybe with humility, There's something else going on here that John is seeing in this vision. I would submit to you that I think what John is doing is he's taking Roman military language and also this Jewish longing for a messianic warrior king, and he uses the same language, but he flips it on its head in an incredibly subversive manner. Nerd out with me. This is really cool. Check this out. This is gnarly. We're going to go through a couple things now. Did you notice in verse 13, even before the battle begins, the battle has not started. What's on Jesus' robe? Blood. But the battle hasn't started, so whose blood is it? Someone said it over there, his own. It can't be his enemies because the battle's already started, or the battle hasn't started. Jesus shows up to the battle with blood on his robe. And then we remember the theme of Revelation that he's the slain lamb. This is why at verse 15 then, at the end of verse 15, we read this. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On the cross, as the slain lamb, Jesus poured out his blood and took on the wrath of God on the cross so that you and I wouldn't have to. It just gets better. Verse 14, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, this is very odd for an army to show up to battle this way. Um, If they're an army showing up to battle, they should be wearing their military uniforms. Sword, helmet, breastplate, all that kind of stuff. And they show up and they're wearing fine linen, white and clean, and that's highlighted for us. Linen, why linen? Linen is for priests. Linen is for a bride. This is not an army showing up to fight. This is a priestly army showing up to announce that the victory's already won. That's quite a difference. We're just getting going. 
Verse 15, let's look at another one. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Go down to verse 21. The rest were killed with this sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse and all the birds gorge themselves on their flesh. What is the weapon in which Jesus fights this ultimate battle? What's the weapon? Sword. Okay. Now it says there's a sword coming out of his mouth. You can interpret this where there's physically like an Excalibur sword coming out of Jesus' mouth. Personally, along with every single scholar, I don't think that's what's going on. Revelation is severely symbolic. What does a sword symbolize when it comes out of someone's mouth? Their words. The word of God. Jesus comes with justice, and he speaks justice, the word of God. This is why, and we know this is confirmed because in verse 13, what, what, what does it say? Jesus is, it doesn't say his name, his name is what? The word of God. Now, this gets cool. How did God create the world? We could, let's, let's, get, let's yell more. Tell me, how did God create the world? Okay, there you go, he spoke. When God comes back in Jesus to bring final justice so that new creation can come, how does he do that? He speaks. This is God's ultimate weapon, is speaking, is the word of God. And the same is true for us today. This is our weapon that we fight with today. That leads into my next thing. Do you notice that this rider, Jesus, on the white horse who comes with the sword out of his mouth, who who his word is what brings the victory, do you notice that it's him alone doing it? Meaning the army behind him, they never engage in the battle. They don't even so much bring out a knife or even a fist. It's Jesus alone who fights this final battle, and even he does it alone through his words. As a quick aside, do we have so much to learn from that with how we fight our enemies today? We use truth and the gospel and the word of God. Using a sword, I mean, it just reminds me, Jesus with Peter as he's getting arrested with Rome. What does Peter, they go to go chop off someone's ear, and what does Jesus tell him? He actually goes to heal that man. Put your sword away. My kingdom's not of this world. It's not the way my kingdom fights. Now, here's the most astonishing thing. Do you notice that there was, there's never an actual battle in this passage? It just says that Jesus shows up on a horse, and then boom. Let me read it for you. Verse 19. Then I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth, and their armies gather together to wage war against a rider on the horse and his army. So they are ready to go. The battle scene is ready. And then verse 20. But the beast was captured. And with it, the false prophet who performed the signs on its behalf. And with these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshiped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Um, as I was thinking about this, it, this is just like if, like if you're at like the local park, you're on the blacktop, you're playing basketball, two on two, three on three, whatever it is. You're playing, it's time to kind of like do a new game, divvy up the teams. And imagine playing basketball at like Ayala Park and Kobe Bean Bryant walks up. He just walks up to the court, and meaning he like wants to get into the game. At that point, if Kobe Bryant walked up to the court and I'm playing two on two, I don't got to say anything. He don't got to say anything. It's game over. It's Kobe Bryant. Yeah. I mean, it don't matter. Whoever's team he's on, he doesn't even have to talk. The game doesn't even have to start. He's on the court. It's game over. Whoever's got Kobe Bryant. The game's over. He doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to dribble a basketball. I already know the outcome of the game. This is Jesus Christ on the final battle. He just shows up. That's how good and powerful he is. Daryl Johnson, his great commentary, Discipleship on the Edge, puts it this way. Jesus, the warrior, rides to the final battle. 
which is never fought because he already fought it at the cross. His robe is already dipped in his own blood. That will preach. Now, first ultimate kind of battle scene right there. Now we turn the page to chapter 20, and we get a couple more final judgment scenes. But let me, let me take a step back here, because um, things are about ready to get crazy. So let me rehash some of this. Um, the one that we just looked at, at, chapter 19, starting to verse 11, the first scene, was of um, Jesus taking the two beasts and throwing them into the fiery lake. Now just this whole series, like each Sunday, like depends upon the pre- preceding Sunday. So if you're gone the last couple weeks, it's going to get confusing. So let me remind you. The two beasts here, um, they represent kind of two things of Rome, of, of corrupt um- empires. The first beast represented kind of like the military economic might of Rome. And the second one um, was kind of like the worship of the emperor, the cult. Those are the beasts and what they represent. All throughout scriptures, especially if you go to the book of Daniel, which John is just, is just front and center in his mind in this whole book, um, Daniel defines for us what a beast symbolizes, and it symbolizes a corrupt empire. When he wrote it, it was Greek, Persia, Assyria. And by the time you get to the first century, it's Rome. So these beasts signify Rome and its corrupt empire, the military economic wing, as well as the, the worshiping the emperor and the cult. So that is what Jesus defeats in this first ultimate battle. And the point of Revelation is that Every generation has new beasts. So for them, in the first century, it was Rome. But there's always a new Babylon. There's always a new Rome. There's always a new beast all throughout the ages. So that is who Jesus first defeats in this first final battle. Now, one of the things that we learned in Revelation 12 was that behind these beasts is a dragon. A serpent, the Satan, the devil. And he is actually the ultimate evil. He's the one actually behind these beasts, kind of using them as puppets to deceive the world. So the real evil isn't necessarily Rome or whatever other corrupt empire. It's the Satan who's behind them. So now in chapter 20 we get the scene of Jesus dealing with this ancient serpent. So now we go to that. Chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years. He put him in prison and This next section, you're going to hear all about this thousand years, and that's what we're going to go into. He threw him into the abyss, and he locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be set free for a short time. And I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, referring to Rome, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. So they stayed allegiant to Jesus, stayed loyal to Jesus in whatever corrupt empire. And here's the promise. They came to life and reigned with Christ A thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Notice this theme here. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison And will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Those are symbols taken from the the prophet Ezekiel. And to gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore, meaning there's a lot. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. 
But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. All right. Welcome to Revelation 20. Um, So this is where things get really crazy. Revelation 20 is probably the most debated, contested chapter in the whole book, uh, from, for some reasons that I'll get into. Um, and it all centers around this thing called the millennium, a thousand years. I'm going to talk about the millennium, and I'm going to talk about the thousand years, but I've got to give a couple of disclaimers before I do that. Um, first, there are quite a lot of opinions about what this thousand years reign is. I mean, do you take it literally, symbolically, all? It just, there's tons of opinions. And so what I want to say is that in, in theology, we have primary things and secondary things. This is a secondary thing, meaning there are primary beliefs that like Jesus is God. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. The Trinity, um, that he physically rose from the grave. Things like that, those are primary things that like we, we have boundary markers on. Like those are orthodox matters. Those are really important. Then you have secondary things, which can still be important. It's not saying that they're not, but it's just saying, hey, we're going to have room to disagree. You can think this, you can think this, and that's okay. We can still be brothers in Christ and serve on mission for the extension of God's kingdom. So there's room for disagreement. Primary things, not so much. This morning when I talk about the millennium, that is a secondary thing. It is, um, let me put it this way, the last 2,000 years there have been brilliant theologians who disagree with one another on this. And so if you disagree with me or I disagree with you, it's all good. We can still love each other. And I'll, I'm going to get into why that, that can be the case. All right? So that's the first disclaimer. The second disclaimer um, that I need to say, and actually, I think this one's actually really important. It needs to be pointed out and named. The millennium is only talked about in Revelation in four verses. How many verses in Revelation um, do you think there are? Whoa, who just said that? Did you listen to first service? Whoa. Dude, that is impressive. Well, as Pastor Dan said, there are 404 verses in Revelation. Four verses are talked about the millennium, which means this. I did, I did a calculator math. 0.9% of the book of Revelation talks about the millennium. 0.9%. Less than 1% of the book. Like, and go test me. Nowhere else is it talking about the book. Nowhere else in the scriptures is the millennium talked about, unless you're looking at something else. But the thousand-year thing is it's just right here. So American pop theology has developed a whole system, and there's been so much name-calling and stuff over four verses that are 0.9% of just the book of Revelation. So I just want to name that. Because we've made something big, which isn't the, the theological driving point of the book of Revelation. All right? So that, that just needs to be named. With that said, now let me wade into the dangerous waters. Um, so we'll put up a slide here. There are three basic options of how to deal with this millennium thing. Now, it's actually more complicated than this. So for those who know this conversation, give me some grace. I don't have all day to talk about it. These are the three basic fundamental options, all right? Premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. By the way, if this bores you, give me like five minutes. I'm going to wrap this up, and then you'll, you'll get the point of it, okay? But I got to do this, otherwise I'll get emails. So premillennialism, postmillennialism, or amillennialism. Let me go over each real quick. Premillennialism pretty much says that um, Christ is going to return here to earth, literally, physically here to earth, and at that time, so it's somewhere in the future, he then he puts Satan away, 
and Christ reigns here on earth for a thousand years. And this hasn't happened yet. So the reason why it's called premillennium is that Christ is coming before the thousand years starts. All right? A thousand years happen, and they, they, this camp usually takes this literally. So like it means a thousand years literally here on earth. Then after the thousand years, then Satan gets let loose. There's the final showdown. Jesus wins. He goes into the lake of fire. All three have the same endings, okay? It's just kind of what happens in between. Postmillennialism is the utter opposite of this. So Jesus comes back after, hence post, the thousand-year reign. Now, some postmillennials will take this literally, symbolically. I don't have time to get into it. Um, but what they will say is that they think that the millennium started with Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension. And so there's this reign here on earth, and Jesus will come back at the end of the thousand years, do his showdown with Satan, beat him, of course, and then bring heaven to earth. Um, the third option is probably the most unique one. It's called awe millennialism. Awe is just kind of like no or like the negation. Uh, people have been asking me for two months, Mark, which of the three are you? It's, okay, well, I already know what's going on with you if you're asking me these questions. Since you've been dying to know, if I had to pick out of the three, and I'm actually not a fan of these three paradigms because I think you're already trying to read Revelation in a way that I'm not sure if that's the point. But if I had to pick one, I would be an all millennialist. You can disagree with that. That's okay. Don't, don't let me influence you. It's all good. It's all good. All millennialism, the point of it is it says that, hey, the millennium is not a statistic. It's a symbol. The reason why they derive it this way and the reason why I would hold to that is because the whole book is severely symbolic. So week one, I did an introduction on how to read apocalyptic literature, and that's why that one matters. You're now seeing it two months later. Revelation is full of numbers that are severely symbolic. Six, 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 seven, 12, 24, 144,000. If John is using a high round number like 1,000, the chances of it that we should take it literally and not symbolically, you're, we're probably missing it. Again, that's my take, along with a lot of scholars. So I think the millennium is symbolic, not to treat it literally. And we're going to come back to what it means then, because there's still truth there. So the way an, an, an all millennialist will get at this is saying, hey, um, in Jesus' life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension, that is when he bound up Satan put Satan in prison, so to speak, during then. And right now is the 1,000 years, symbolically, meaning the millennium is the church age. It's what we are living in right now between his first and his second coming. And Jesus is king right now. He's Lord right now, and he's reigning in heaven. You don't got to wait for him. He's reigning right now in heaven. And then he will come back Satan gets unleashed, they fight, Jesus wins, New Jerusalem comes down. Now, this helps us make sense of pieces of Revelation 12, um, but I think it actually more so helps us make sense of things like Mark 3.27. Real quick, Jesus is being, he, Jesus called a demon. Do you know that? Jesus was called a demon. How crazy is that? But he says something like this. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first trying tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. The reason why I bring this up is because I think that in his ministry, because of words like this, Jesus bound up Satan then. So Satan's already bound up versus a premillennialist. It hasn't happened yet. So you may ask, okay, well then how is Satan deceiving the nations today? Well, yeah, it's through the beasts, the corrupt empires, just like Rome in the first century and gener generation on it goes. Best example I can think of, man, it's like a, it's like a mafia boss go uh, godfather or like a cartel drug lord. Man, those dudes go to prison, they're still ruling. They're still running their, their operation through all their agents outside of prison. Like, dude, El Chapo's in prison right now, but I'll tell you right now, that dude is still calling shots. It's the same thing. Bound Satan to prison, but he's working in and through beasts and other people to deceive the nation and to dethrone God's good creation. That is why 
I'm going to start to bring this full circle now. In Revelation 19, in the first final vision of justice, Jesus comes on the white horse to defeat the beast. Because he's got to defeat the beast because Satan is using them to bring havoc and death and destruction to his creation. Jesus has to defeat them. He defeats them. And then in Revelation 20, Jesus sets Satan loose to have his ultimate showdown with him. Now, one of the weirdest things in this passage is why would God let Satan loose? Why would he bound him, put him in prison, metaphorically speaking, and then set him loose? It's a very odd thing best example I can think of, it's like in a boxing match. When someone gets knocked down, they get knocked down to the ground. Satan right now, metaphorically speaking, in the millennium, is on the ground. He's been, he got knocked out in, on the cross in the resurrection. Like something happened then. He's on the floor. But Jesus kind of wants him to come up, to stand up one more time so that he can make it crystal clear to everyone that he's going to do the final knockout punch. He's like, all right, get up one more time, because I'm going to make it so clear, just in case people were wondering, that you, my friend, not my friend, are done. So, Revelation 20.10, this is like the all-time one, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Now, all of that to say, I'm done with kind of the crazy stuff. All of that to say, rather than us trying to figure out the timeline, the what and the how of the millennium, which there's, a, like I said, th- three basic options, I'd rather us focus on the why of the millennium. Why is John bringing this up? That is way more important than when and how. So why does, what is his main point in bringing up this whole thousand-year thing? You ever ask that question? Let me give you two answers. Uh, the first comes from Revelation scholar Richard Bauckham. He writes this, very to the point. The theological point of the millennium is solely to demonstrate the triumph of the martyrs. The triumph of the martyrs. If you're being oppressed and persecuted, this is good news. Another one, um, Scott McKnight, another New Testament scholar, puts it this way. The millennium is a symbol of assurance and encouragement for the martyr witnesses. John offers assurance that those who have been judged and condemned to death by the dragon and the wild things, the beasts, will be vindicated and rewarded with the kingdom. In the end, When the heavenly perspective is finally revealed, and that is what apocalypse means, revelation means, and the truth becomes evident, not only will all enemies be defeated and judged, but the martyr witnesses will conquer and be granted life and rule. The millennium symbolically demonstrates the triumph of the allegiant witnesses, those who have suffered on account of, of the Jesus Christ witness, will in the end rule universally and receive the special rewards promised to those who have paid the highest price. The millennium is actually really good news. If you're one of these seven churches and you're facing persecution from Rome, that's all we've talked about for two months. You're being persecuted for your faith. You're being tempted to become like Rome and to worship the emperor rather than saying that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then John, your pastor, gives you this vision and he says, hey, man, the dragon's going to be defeated and you, the ones, you who are being oppressed and persecuted, you are actually going to rule and reign and sit on a throne with King Jesus. That is good news. That brings hope and encouragement and, and assurance in the midst of oppression. That is the why of the millennium. It's to bring encouragement and hope to a people who are being oppressed. To put it in street language, you may be losing now, but in the end, you will win with Jesus. You may be losing now, but in the end, you will be ruling 
and winning with Jesus. This is the point of verses 4 through 6 in chapter 20. Let me reread it now with that in mind. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. The ones who were persecuted are now sitting on thrones. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They did not give in to an oppressive empire. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Man, you were made to reign. How crazy is that? I never heard that growing up. You're made to reign. That's the dignity of humanity. Now, of all that, from the last 10, 15 minutes, was so confusing, I got good news for you. I'm going to share a simple story that I think gets to the point of it that you can put aside all the kind of millennium options. Here's a story. It comes from Daryl Johnson. There's a group of seminarians and a janitor. Uh, Seminarians are pastors who go get their master's degree and study theology and ministry. Um, Seminarians are known just to live in books, theory. So these seminarians, they uh, decided they want to go play basketball. So they, they go to a local gym, high school gym, and the janitor does them a favor and lets them play inside the gym like after hours. So he gives them an hour to play. So all these seminarians are playing basketball. They take their backpacks, their books. They put it all on the side wall. And so while they're playing basketball, the janitor goes over there and starts reading their books. He's reading the Bible. And one of the seminarians walks up to the janitor, and he's like, um, what are you reading? The janitor's like, well, I'm reading the book of Revelation. The seminary chuckled, yeah, 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 right, dude. No, no, really. The, the janitor said, I'm really reading the book of Revelation. And the seminarian, you know, he's heard all these professors say that, you know, no one can really understand this strange book of Revelation. So he asked the, the, the janitor, he's like, do you even understand what you're reading? Oh, yes, replied the janitor, smiling. He chuckled again. The seminarian asked almost sarcastically, well, then tell me what it means. The janitor looked to his right, his left, leaned into the seminarian's ear and whispered, Jesus wins. If anything in the last 15 minutes is a blur to you, just walk out with the profound, simple truth that Jesus wins. Now, there's one more final vision of justice in um, chapter 20. Here's what we've seen so far. The Satan, the dragon, and the two beasts have been thrown into the lake of fire, forever destroyed. And now we read the last section in chapter 20. It is about death itself and the judgment of all humans. So let's read this, starting in verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, that is every human to ever live, that's you and I, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened. So there's multiple books here. The second book is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And by the way, isn't that an interesting thing? This is not even like a person. This is like, like an idea, like death itself. And Hades, which was kind of the underworld of the ancient world, was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Um, Real quick, as an aside, a lot of times people talk about the lake of fire. Let me just say this. I don't think we are to take the lake of fire um, 
literally in a physical manner, meaning an actual physical lake of fire. The reason why I say that is, as with everything in Revelation, it's symbolic. Now, what you got to know is that I think the symbol actually gets at something that's much worse. So, what do I think the lake of fire is? I think it's an eternal sense of profound, spiritual, deep anguish and complete separation from God and all that is good. That is hell. That is actually worse than a physical lake of fire. But moving on. Death itself is thrown into the lake of fire forever, eternally destroyed. Satan and all the other evil forces are thrown into hell, the lake of fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love that. Yeah, Jesus wins. The bad guys are taken care of. Again, Jesus comes on a white horse. He's getting rid of all the bad guys. I'm down for that, Mark. That sounds good. But then there's that last line. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. I thought, I thought God is a God of love. Not a God of judgment. You can't, you can't judge me. It's like old school stuff. Mark, are you like, are you like, something like Southern Baptist or something? If you're a Southern Baptist, I'm sorry. It's 2023. It's almost 2024. We don't believe in a God of judgment and wrath anymore. Come on, that's old stuff. I believe it was three weeks ago. Last couple weeks of my life have been a bit of a blur with my dad's passing. Um, But there was a quote I shared about three weeks ago. And when I was preaching on Revelation 6 through 16, which is all about God's judgment, um, riveting thing to preach on. And um, I got a lot of positive feedback on that quote. I want to reshare it this morning, and then I'm going to add something onto it. So this is kind of a part B series within a series on, on God's judgment. Um, so if you didn't watch it, go watch it, because this part probably won't make sense. But it comes from a theologian at Yale named Mirzlof Wolf. And he wrote this in his book, Free of Charge. Here's what he wrote. I used to think that wrath was unworthy of God. Isn't God love? Shouldn't divine love be beyond wrath? God is love, and God loves every person and every creature. That's exactly why God is wrathful against some of them. My last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in former Yugoslavia the region from which I come. According to some estimates, 200,000 people were killed and over 3 million were displaced. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination and I could not imagine God not being angry. Or think of Rwanda in the last decade of the past century where 800,000 people were hacked to death in 100 days. By the way, if this makes you feel uncomfortable, that's the point. How did God react to the carnage? By doting on the perpetrators in a grandparently fashion? By refusing to condemn the bloodbath but instead affirming the perpetrators' basic goodness? Sarcasm. Wasn't God fiercely angry with them? Though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think that I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful at the sight of the world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. All right. That was the part I read three weeks ago. (laughs) Here comes the second half. I intentionally saved us three weeks ago knowing that this passage was coming. Here's what he writes in the very next couple lines. And this, I mean, I just think it speaks for itself. He he writes this then. Once we accept the appropriateness of God's wrath, condemnation, and judgment, there is no way of keeping it out there reserved for others. We have to bring it home as well. I originally resisted the notion of a wrathful God because I dreaded being that wrath's target, and I still do. I knew I couldn't just direct God's wrath against others 
As if it were a weapon I could aim at targets I particularly detested. It's God's wrath, not mine. The wrath of the one and an impartial God, lover of all humanity. And listen to this. If I want it to fall on evildoers, I must let it fall on myself when I deserve it. Also, once we affirm that God's condemnation of wrongdoing is appropriate, we cannot reserve God's condemnation for heinous crimes. Where would the line be drawn? On what grounds could it be drawn? Everything that deserves to be condemned should be condemned in proportion to its weight as an offense. From a single slight to a murder, from indolence, which is laziness, to idolatry, from lust to rape, to condemn heinous offenses but not light ones would be manifestly unfair. An offense is an offense and deserves condemnation. What's that? Yeah, it will. Revelation 20, verse 12. Let me read this again. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the book. Verse 15. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Let me say this. The lake of fire is about justice, not torture. God is not vindictively punishing and torturing people eternally like some sick tyrant. That's what Rome did. They're not just, and they're not loving, but God is. What I think is going on with the lake of fire is that God is a God of justice. And what he's doing in this as we head into Revelation 21 and 22 for our Advent series for December, the point of Revelation, the middle of it towards the end, is to remove all the rubble and the evil and the demonic forces and garbage to make way for the eternal city to come down here on earth, for heaven to come to earth, for God's presence to flood this place, for there to be a purity. And evil cannot exist in God's presence. He has to bring judgment. And so every single human being, you and I, will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will have to give account for our lives, both the good and the bad. And if you're anything like me, that scares me. And I just had my father pass away, and I am re-examining everything in my life. But one thing I do know is that the line of evil runs in in all of our hearts and it runs in my heart. It isn't just the enemies over there. Now that's bad news. But here's the good news, the better news. And I'll let Daryl Johnson put it better than I can. Let this minister to your soul this morning. At the judgment, the book on me is going to be opened. But then the book on Jesus is going to be opened. And then the book on Jesus is going to be placed over the book on me. And in my place of my deeds, the court sees his deeds. And the book on me lists my deeds. And the Lamb's book lists his deeds. And his deeds are deeds done on behalf of sinners like me. That is good news. And so judgment is coming. But for those of us who worship the God who died on that, his book is placed on top of our book. That is the point of Revelation, the slain lamb. Don't get caught up in some timeline of a millennium. The point is, you are suffering and being persecuted right now. By the way, we aren't right now as Americans, and let this be a wake-up call, because maybe we're not doing things in such a way, maybe that we should be, and I don't want to worship persecution, but man, there's a wake-up call. And we worship the slain lamb. Tear back the curtain. This is reality. Revelation puts this elsewhere all throughout it. Let me just read three verses that we're going to end on. Revelation 12, 11. They triumphed over him by the blood. How do they triumph? They triumphed over the devil. How? Not by fighting, but by how? By the blood of the lamb. And by the word of their testimony, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. 
Let's go one more. Revelation 1.6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom, take that Rome, and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Let me give you one more. Father, Son, and Spirit. Revelation 5, 9 through 10. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, Jesus, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people on earth, from Israel and Gaza and Palestine and Argentina and America and Cuba and China and Russia and Ukraine, every country. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and guess what? They will reign, you and I will reign on the earth forever. I invite the worship team up. We're going to head into a time of response. Two things. If you're here and you're being oppressed, and that, could, that looks different. It could be physically, it could be emotionally, spiritually. The devil's in the business of oppressing. And our God is in the business of freeing and loving, and bringing hope, and encouragement, and assurance. And so we want to make space for that this morning. So we're going to have a prayer team that's going to come up. If you feel oppressed by anything, can you come up so that people who are part of this kingdom of priests can pray over you and speak encouragement and hope and freedom by the blood of Jesus Christ who fights all of our victories for us? Secondly, Some of us in here think that we can win, that we can triumph by something other than the blood of the Lamb. You've been trying a long time. Nothing will bring victory in your life in the long term. Maybe a little bit here on earth, a couple years. But in the long term, the only thing that will bring you victory is the slain Lamb of God. When that book is opened, your book's already been opened, The question is, will Jesus' book be laid on top of it? Life is so fragile. I lost my dad out of nowhere. Don't miss the chance. Do you want his book over your book? I do. So let's do what we only know how to do. Extend your hands and say, come Holy Spirit, come minister to us, come fill us. There's a very real enemy out there and we cast him out right now. Speak your life and your victory into us, Jesus. Amen.